Greetings, nerds. This is Cena Nerd. I'm your host, Sarah Belmont, and with me, as always, is our Mr. Producer, Will Paul. How are you doing tonight, Will? Doing very well, sir. How are you doing this evening? Well, you've already managed to surprise me, because during pre-show talk, when we normally do not talk about what we're going to talk about, <laughs> you spilled some tea, and so now I'm just like, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe, you know, but I could have been doing a head fake, too, you know. <laughs> oh, well, I, 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 I think I've talked to you long enough to know when you're pulling a head fake. You know, yeah, there, sure. there's some tells. I, I, I hear your voice on a regular basis. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, after seven years of doing this, we kind of know. Yeah, there, there are some things where, if we were to play a game of poker, it would be hard to bluff one another. <laughs> right. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talking about bluffing and playing poker, House of Dragon dropped a trailer. Actually, it was two because yeah. there was the green side trailer and the black side trailer, which wasn't, nobody was expecting that, right? Everyone no. kept no. saying the trailer is coming. So when I looked, I'm like, oh, there's two of them. Yeah. Um, now, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. However, I think the tagline, all must choose, is stupid. And here's why. Who the heck is on Team Green? I, just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I need to know a fan that watched the first season that is legitimately on, like, Team Green. And, yes, I, I get it. We got some incest happening in, on Team Black. But, but there, I mean, my if you're on Team Green – then I just, I need to understand you. And in my opinion, that means you did not like Viserys at all. And if that is the case, then why are you watching the show? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, seriously, though, uh, if anybody is on Team Green, please, you know, on our socials, if you if you listen to us on YouTube, drop a, in a comment um, or Make the case. just Make the yeah, case. make the case for Team Green because I, yeah, I mean, to your point about the trailers, just the just brilliant marketing, just effing brilliant as far as just, I, I, even though I, I agree with you that the tagline is, you know, a little like, okay, we got, you know, hyping it up. It was smart, you know, they, you know, they dropped the posters and stuff yesterday and, um, that sort of sort of set the stage. I know we had the little teaser trailer back late last year, but um, you know it, the the two trailers, and we got the release date too, which is June sixteenth. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it really set really. Well, as I was watching the trailers again the night before we were recording, it really just like, oh yeah, it it just does a great job of just framing the conflict between the two and like the team green trailer just remembering how the speaking of Viserys and Alicent like hearing what she wanted to hear <laughs> whenever he said Aegon <laughs> right. and 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 then of course on the team black just uh Rhaenyra and and Damon and just you know they this I I have I can't wait for June I'm just like this is one of those series I you know I didn't watch Game of Thrones so I was new to the new to the universe and the franchise and i'm i'm 100 on on board with the show can't i don't think it's going to disappoint at all i mean so i'm going to be honest besides my thoughts about the um tagline being a bit lame i honestly i watched both of them mm -hmm. um i didn't like it i did mm -hmm. not i felt like they told me, and I get it, they were trying to attract viewers who may not have watched the first season. Okay, whatever. But to me, I appreciate the first season trailers a lot more. There was just something about it where it felt, I don't know, there was no, there was not enough tension for me. And mm. um, there was a lot more fights and a lot more action sequences. And then when, when, um team green like we get a few clips from them talking about like allison's point of view and everything i'm just like yeah. I, olivia cook where are you you did great in season one i don't i don't know this this <laughs> isn't hitting this isn't hitting the way i want it to mm. so 
so I'm still obsessed with this show. Don't get me wrong. I I didn't need to watch the trailers to want to see this the yeah. the second season. Um, by all means, but I honestly, when I compare it to other trailers of things, I was a bit disappointed. I I can see that. I can see your point, and I think, you know, maybe it's where we're where we're coming from as far as you know. You're been in this longer than I have as far as the Game of Thrones stuff. So I mean, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that to to mean that you're like having the carryover effect that many fans had the way that that series ended no more more of i just know you as far as how you react to things and trailers and stuff and and, yeah and it just makes this i guess this it sounds to me it just sounds like this just reinforces things that you already know right right i didn't Um, i guess i guess where i can really articulate that where my disappointment stems from is there was no scene or no part of either trailer where I was like, oh, I can't wait to see that. I can't wait to understand the context of this because I'm just like, okay. But at the same time, Will, like that, I all I can hope for is that means they're holding things back. Yeah, exactly. So, so, you know, like beggars can't be choosers. I'm, I'm fine. As long as, as long as they held back the right things, I am perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. there, there's, it's, I think I just want to make sure from my perspective, there's nothing wrong for me saying like this trailer disappointed me. It has nothing to do with the show itself. Right, right. Like it's advertisement for that show, but I I don't I'm not gonna hold it against it because I'm not gonna watch these trailers um between now and when I actually sit down to watch the show. So I'm not gonna like hold on to like, oh, they showed that in the trailer. No. Yeah, yeah. But, so yeah. um speaking Makes about sense. like mixed review trailers, uh we had we got a few of them this week, but um Star Wars Acolyte trailer came out and before it came out it also dropped the poster yeah. now will mm-hmm. please please explain to me how can the poster be so much cooler than yep. the trailer yeah I, like did, yeah. did the person who designed the trail like poster watch the trailer <laughs> i don't think so because <laughs> I, I you know this was one like like house of the dragon this is one of those trailers. I knew the show. We finally did get confirmation that as far as the release date uh, prior to the, I think prior to the trailer and the poster, which is June 4. I mean, we knew it was coming in June, but I think, but anyway, I, that trait, when I saw that poster and the lightsaber smeared mm-hmm. with blood, I was just like, all what they've been saying about this show going in a different direction, it was going back to the high Republic. It is set a hundred years before mm-hmm. uh, Phantom Menace. It was supposed to be a thriller, mystery, you know, darker take on on things. That that poster, I was like, oh, oh yeah, uh, it got me hyped. When I saw the trailer, it was okay, but I just felt like it was like I just felt I don't know I I felt like it was just just, uh, just a remix of what I've seen before, right. and especially when I watched it again tonight before. You know, I had the initial reaction. I was like, okay, this is cool. But watching it again, and I was just and really watching it from a critical eye, I was like, this just feels like it's just a rehash of stuff that we've seen before. Yes, they're trying to, there's a Sith. Yes, it's the High Republic. They're new people. But it, it just like, all right, I feel like I'm in a, I'm in a Skywalker saga again. Oh, right. It's It's because... What Star Wars has been doing with their universe is they've been, instead of, like, chronological order, there's, like, different points of time and things are separated. And yet they they even play into this idea, oh, so during this time, 
the Sith were in charge. During this time, it was the Jedi. And then here's the story of how it flipped. And here's the story how it flipped back and back. And you're just like, I don't care if this is 100 years before. You're telling me the same the same story, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Now, they also, they they could have done it a lot more they could have been more creative with it because from my i also understood this like almost to be like the origin story of the dark side and really where it came from and how it disrupted everything and caused this battle that has now gone on for years Mm -hmm. um but but they didn't sell it that way they sold it more as like okay so so is this another it's just feel, feels like more of the same and yes i i always argue there star wars for whatever reason i've been in fatigue mode for a while now with their shows mm-hmm. um i am the one thing that got me though is the main actress in it i want to say her name is amanda something and, uh, that's uh stanfield yeah, yeah, um, she's a she's a pretty good actress. I've seen her yeah. in a few things, so I'm I'm curious to see her, and I'm especially now that it's like she's gonna be the dark side yeah. person. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's interesting, but yeah. you didn't really hear her say anything, <laughs> and so yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh. which which is again more of the same. I'm so tired of the the dark side being so quiet, and I'm just like, no, yeah. you need more yeah. talkers. <laughs> need more talkers. I mean, I know you know, it, like Carrie Ann Moss showing up. I mean, I felt I was like, I I, I couldn't help but like I kept thinking of Trinity. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, oh, absolutely. I mean, it's real that. I mean, it didn't do anything. It was just like she's playing the same type of character, and it's just like. And, you know, go against type um, or something. But, you know, was, I mean, the fights seem very, like, still what we saw in, like, Obi, like, in, in Ahsoka when they had, like, a lot of those dark scenes um, and, you know, mm-hmm. where those lightsaber battles were underwhelming mm-hmm. in many cases. Um, so, and also, we learned the runtime for these shows. And it's eight episodes, 30, 35 minutes. So if you're going to do it that short and because we've seen enough of the Star Wars shows now to But isn't that like Ahsoka? Yeah, yeah. They yeah. just just make a movie. Yeah. At this point. Yep. I I I think I think this show is going to get very similar criticism that Ahsoka got. Mm-hmm. Especially Plus, now that I understand the run times are pretty much the same and yeah. it it's just yeah. Yeah, I think there's one. I think she's the, the showrunner said she she said maybe went 40, 35, 40 minutes. But you know that's just when you know a short runtime like that. But you know when things really are just really getting going in a story, um, it it fades to black, and I'm just like it just it just makes it really really hard. So I'm trying. So I was when I saw the poster, I was super hyped because it, it, it I was like oh something fresh, something new. Yeah. Post trailer, I'm kind of on the fence. Um, just going to hold judgment and 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 see where it goes. I'll judge it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least I didn't see a bunch of sand. <laughs> I yeah. Thought about you. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, it, it's interesting as we talk about a a universe that seems to just be on the downward trend um, and can't figure out a way to reinvent itself. We're going to switch over and talk about as the spider verse, which continues to expand um, and viewers have yet to get tired of. Well, it's been announced that the spider verse animated short called the spider within a spider within is set to debut on YouTube on March 26th. The short will focus on Miles having a panic attack while dealing with the pressures of being a teenager, student, and protecting the city. The short shares how Miles reaches out to get help f- for his mental health challenges. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I saw this today, and um, 
it uh, yeah, it's a Spider Verse, the Spider Within, the Spider Verse stories, the 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 title, and uh, it's a project that actually um, the Kevin Love Foundation uh, Fund is uh, partnering with the with Sony to do this. And Kevin Love, for folks who who follow NBA basketball, uh, are probably very familiar with this story. He's a phenomenal player. But he all, he's also been very open about his mental health challenges, and uh, he is uh, one of the backers of this part project. Uh, and they're also even going to do a companion piece with it uh, to to help, um, you know, a curriculum that you know could be there for teenagers and other folks uh, that will, you know, give people opportunity to really open up. Uh, show coping mechanisms. Apparently, I think they're going to do like a, a creative storyboard, so that's interactive, so you can can use it. And you know, one of the things Kevin Love mentioned that uh, that he's that we'll see in the series is, is Miles. You know, as he's dealing with this panic attack and you know, it, opening up to his father and and showing you know how whenever we do have our mental health challenges uh, on things, you know, it don't not to clam up and keep it all inside. So. It sounds like it's going to be a mix of both entertainment, but also going to be helpful, uh, which I think is great. So I can't wait to see this on YouTube next week. Yeah, I like how they're they're not just doing it to keep Spider-Verse on everyone's mind, but there's a message beneath it. Um, So I I can really appreciate that. And it's a good use of platform and Mm. to provide content. So be it. Put that on your calendars, people. Um, we will probably be talking about it in the future. Um, all right, so let's let's just get Invincible out of the way because Will doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I don't want to talk about it. It's not that I don't want to talk about it. It's just uh... <laughs> he doesn't want to continue talking about it. <laughs> it's just you know we we're, we're going to start. We're looking at three body problem as well coming up. Drops uh, tomorrow, right? Yeah, it's already here. Oh, it's already and, on Netflix. Oh, it's already on. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. And so yeah, so let's just try to figure out which which way to go, folks. So. <laughs> right. So we we did watch um, Invincible season two episode five. This must come as a shock, which is the first episode to drop of the second half of the second season. Um. So. I watched this on Sunday, and I will be honest, I actually was pretty engaged um, because they did a pretty good job of reminding me things that were happened um, during the um, the fourth episode, as well as starting to to talk about like, okay, well, where could these characters potentially go from there? I can appreciate that Mark had to take home his baby brother. Yep. Um, to, to then become a single father. No. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> um, much to Cecil's dismay. And, and so, but then it, it, it lost me during like the third act fight sequences mm-hmm. that were going on and anything to do with, I want to say the guardian stuff. Yeah. I, I have not followed that storyline at all. So I never have any investment in it, but overall I was just like, okay, I I'm here for it. We'll, we'll, we'll just wrap it up. But uh, during our pre-show discussion, we'll raise some points and, and it does sound like next week we'll, We'll be starting three body, one problem, and we may or may not ever finish season two of Invincible. Um, Stick with this, folks, though. Don't, don't, while we talk about episode five, though, because maybe, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I, I did, it was, it was, I did like the return um, of, of the show. It was both, both the, season premiere as well as the midterm mid mid season return both had mark jacked up getting beat up you know with you know with from his father um and then you know again with the viltrumites you know at the end of of the um first half of the second season but i like the way that they turned the narrative this time around and, and instead of mark being 
you know, beat down and this, you know, how he responded after the first, what happened at the end of the, of the season. Now, like as you noted, you know, he's he's on Thraxon and learning about his his brother, half brother, uh, also you know, helping the society rebuild. He has a purpose to the place that he actually like lost. He was it ended up being like two months that he that he was there, um, mm-hmm. and, and so um, and and so it, it it definitely and I think I think Nolan after being taken away. Uh, he wanted Mark to to read the books and stuff, and, and I think Mark was started to understand where Nolan it was was coming from, and and why he is such a you know he 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 goes from planet to planet like you know basically siring kids. <laughs> I mean, but but big, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, I I thought it was a good. You're right. It 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 was engaging. The stuff too, where we found out what was truly going on with Donald. That that I, I like that story because I know we were both wondering what was going on with him in the first half of the season too, uh, and 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 especially. So those were all cool things I, I did like about it. Uh, the Guardian story, I was like you as well. I mean, I just they, these characters just don't resonate with me at all. So I think that's where some of my reticence and 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 kind of. Kind of the, like where I feel like the show gets uneven at times. It, it's just like if it just solely focused on Mark and his and things that are going on there, it's a solid show. But the other things, and I know it's an ensemble. It just th- those parts just don't. I don't it rock with it. it like it's that. never felt like an ensemble to me. Yeah. If, yeah, if that, that was the intention, yeah. then they missed it because they yeah. really, from the first episode, made this about Mark and Nolan. Yeah. And having, like, there, there's such a dis- detachment between Mark and the Guardians mm-hmm. that I don't, I don't feel like I'm watching a team show. So, granted, we have Adam Eve, who, because they did that... Um, those two episodes that were kind of part of the season, but not really. Uh, I I understand her character a little bit yeah. more than I did during the first season, but but they're not going to do that for every single character on the Guardians, and that's not really the what you should have to do in order to understand character as part of the ensemble. So I just I don't I I feel like they really need to figure out a way to make the guardians more present in Mark's story for, for me to invest in them as characters. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Y- yeah, I, um, to go back to, uh, to go back to, uh, what was his name? Donald? You said his name. No. See, Connor? Uh, Do- Donald. 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 Donald, yeah. Uh, Cecil, how much Cecil. I pay attention to the show. <laughs> yeah, C- Cecil, Donald, Cecil. because I wanted to say my joke. They made him into Cliff from Doom Patrol. Done. <laughs> so, <clears throat> anyway, so that was about Donald, and we talked about Mark becoming a single father to his half alien brother. Uh, yeah. 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 It, it's just. There, there's not really a a lot that technically happened in this episode because it is the mid season return, and it's been so long since the fourth episode that they had to kind of explain. Okay, so while Mark was here, he's gonna come back to Earth, and then see, like, basically see what went on with his mom while he was gone and what went on with his girlfriend, um, who were both who I found to be really interesting because there's, there's resentment that's building. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm waiting for that argument to happen and for that shoe to drop and for, for Mark to really start to understand Nolan's perspective as being not fully human. I I don't think in the first season um, that it's ever fully dawned on him what that means. Um, and just because you have powers, well, that becomes that's from a part of you that's from this other species. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I think I, that they have a lot to explore. 
Um, but at the same time, this release schedule has done no favors for this show. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it it it, it didn't. Um, I agree with you that, in particular with Amber, because mom. Yeah, you know, I, I still, you know, she's she's got her story. I, I don't know her Mark talking about the books and and and, and he, you know she where she what she did with them. But uh, Amber, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, that that that's that re, that resentment is building. I mean, she's being supportive, and but there's there's starting to see some cracks in the foundation there uh, with their relationship as far as being supportive. And I think you you hit the nail on the head as far as Mark really now in the second season is really starting to understand what his father went through. Um, and, and, and especially after he saw from the consequences of it, not necessarily with earth, but with another planet with the Viltrumites and what could happen to earth. If, uh, if he, if he doesn't like, it doesn't follow in Nolan's footsteps as far as trying to protect these societies from from the from the Viltrumites right. mission of conquering everything. So so those those were some really good moments. And then I did a pre, I did like how they tied the first season story uh, with uh, uh, with Shape Smith and and the whole Martian um, uh, uh, astronauts. You know, so I, I do those are the, those are the things I think it also does well as as far as building on previous uh, previous episodes and 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 it reminds you of like th- th- there are you know there is a a overall arc and and things that happened in the previous seasons you know d- does have impact on subsequent seasons so so that i did like that aspect of the story uh this week as well uh and it, you know so when when but again when mark and the guardians do finally get together it's just like you said, it, it it doesn't seem organic. It just seems like very forced. Yeah. Yeah. To to go back to um his mom, um, what I was saying was more or what I w- saw was more about how she's during the first half of the season, we we saw a lot from her of, about essentially the grieving process of her husband, of the life that she once had. Mm-hmm. And, and now she's gone through two months without her son, who technically is the only tie left that she has to Nolan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wonder if that allowed her some peace. Yeah. Just because you love your child, mm-hmm. but he is still a part of Nolan and still like tied to them in that way. So when just because Nolan left doesn't mean that you're not shackled in some sort of way um, because you have a kid together. And now on top of it, she's presented with, oh, Nolan, like when he went away, he went and he um, got together with another woman. And also reproduced. And so now you're you're also not only having to continue raising your own son, but also Nolan's half son. So yeah. I think yeah. that there is a very interesting angle to do with her character in mm-hmm. terms of her trying to figure out what this means, especially as she continues. I think she says something about this in the episode, like... Yeah, Clean, cleaning up Nolan's mess like yeah. constantly. Constantly, um, yep. So, yeah. so it's just yeah. So, yeah. so, I think they teased a lot of stuff. Um, they did. They while did. at the same time, I'm like, no, <laughs> 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 oh, no, don't, yeah. don't, don't do this to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They did tease a lot. They did tease. I'm glad you brought that up about about uh, Mark's mother because uh, that that. I just felt like they scratch. They did tease it. It, it was, uh, as you rightly noted, this first episode back after a break, so you don't want to get too deep into it. But they did set up um, sort of the uh, the thread for you know now that you have Nolan's child from another mother under your roof, and Mark's asking you to help take care of it, and that kind of thing. It definitely does set up some some interesting plot points that they can pursue. Hopefully, they'll pursue them well. Um, 
like they did with her when she was you know, at the, with the support group. I thought that, like they did that was something that stood out for me in the first half of the second season. So. Yep. All right. Well, that is a wrap on our discussion of Invincible Season 2, Episode 5. Don't forget about Alan. (laughs) Alan's back. I said, don't forget Alan's back. (laughs) I didn't forget. I was just moving on to the next show because it sounded like we were ending. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Alan's back. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. So that brings us to Shogun, Episode 5, Broken to the Fist. And the IMDb summary says Blackthorn and Mariko struggle to contain their secret that could get them both killed. Yabushige searches for the spy who has betrayed his intentions to Lord. Uh, Will, what did you think about this episode? Oh, this episode, it's like, I really, this was like, well, well, I can't say every week that's my favorite, but this one really was really good this week. Uh, I think it was just a very, very well-rounded story. Uh, Tornaga shows back up to deal to see what the, the consequences of of what his son had wrought <laughs> with the with the cannon attack. Um, Blackthorn, the whole triangle: Blackthorn, Fuji, uh, and Mariko, with the with the return of a certain person who you called it. You you were right. He he. Bentaro. Bentaro is uh, not dead. I can see. Yeah, that. yeah. No, um, he's not dead, and I did say it, and then you questioned. You made me I second did. guess myself. I was. I I did. I I was wrong. I was wrong. I will freely admit. I I, I, I thought that uh, thought that he was a goner, and uh, but they they figured out he he got some help from some Ronin, and he's back. So I, yeah. I, I just yeah. don't appreciate that we didn't. I still, I feel like they took the easy way out of explaining how he's back. Mm. And I think it was easier to do that in the book. But visually, from a from a television perspective, or even from, from a movie perspective, it seems a bit far-fetched. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, what was it, was it 20, 20 Ronin that, uh, however many Ronin that helped him out, but only, yeah, it, but it took him 20 days to return, and only two of them survived, or whatever, it was like, I guess it was a tell, not show kind of situation with, with well, how it, he got back. It definitely was, it just bothered me, because, I mean, like, I don't, I guess there was nothing planted in that episode where he quote unquote dies that would say, Oh, he could, he could survive because there are Ronin over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I haven't, yeah. And I haven't read the book and I, I want to say I was listening to at one recap from somewhere. I don't know if it was, uh, uh, Rogan and uh, Steve Miller uh, or, or another one where I think they switched that from the book, um, where I think on the, in the book, he actually did commit, honorable suicide there after he um fall off the off the invade well he actually he fought him off and then before he could get captured he he, he killed himself uh so i think this may have been a change so if any folks out there who've read the book can can, can it correct us uh please please do so because i no, i haven't I don't read think it, it yet. is yeah. because then a recap that i was listening to who I was listening to Roka's recap and his panelist is a book reader and the way he talked about Ben Toro and the events of this episode with Mariko, those still happen. Okay. So I I don't think it was a change from the book. I think that it got confused because people were starting, were talking about cultural implications Mm -hmm. of what could potentially happen. Um, But but yeah, while and I think a lot of the book readers are doing a good job while also like holding back and letting yeah. people who have not read the books be surprised by the events of the series. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but let's just be like Will was surprised. I was not surprised because I no, you weren't. Him. No, I I I I I, 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 I was sitting in the airport when I when I was watched when I was watching the episode and then when it popped up and he was back, I was like, all right, I, I will. Ha- I made a note to like. Give you your your props. Um, you got that one, and um, 
I was wrong. The the thing too, whenever he did return, it just really, um, you know, the, Mar- Mariko's face uh, when she, whenever she found out, and, and you know, he's standing there, and just, just you know, hats off to Anna Sawai who's like playing the character, playing her because the the the, the face acting in that moment was just on top. I mean, all the various emotions that that I'm sure. Marco was feeling just this on full display there from, you know, especially given that where the showrunner on the official podcast of the show uh, did confirm that, um, you know, Blackthorn and, and Marco did sleep together. So, so you got this and now he's back and all the things, of course, then we learned that he's an abusive, well, we, we knew he was an abusive spouse, but then we saw, you know, it play out in this episode very, very uh, deeply and troubling. So, um, yeah, hats off to her as far as the way, the way she conveyed what she what the character was feeling at that moment. So what what do you make of the fact that we're given Mariko's backstory in this episode and which has been hinted at in the mm-hmm. first four episodes and alluded to and the shame that came to her family was because her father killed the um, emperor that was preceded um take you go take take go and 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 assassinated him not not because he wanted the power but because he he knew that that ruler at the time was very corrupt um so then because of rituals honor and respect and everything everyone immediately went after her family to Mm -hmm. kill them um, her father ended up committing suicide, and she, and this is where I'm like, can we get a little bit more context? Because she just so happens to end up marrying Buntaro before, <laughs> I guess, I guess, I, how do, I just want to understand the timeline. Yeah. So, because the way it keeps being explained, it sounds like he married her after the shame had happened. Um, but I, but that doesn't make sense to me of how she would be able to marry him after that all played out. So she ends up marrying him and um, therefore gets protection essentially. And she wants to kill herself to die with her family. And um, he, uh, every year on the anniversary of um, her father's death, uh, asks to commit suicide, and she, he orders her to live. So, so considering the abuse we saw displayed from him, what do you make of him always uh, making her live? Um, so that's a lot to unpack there. Um, so as far as the, the, the shame that befell her house, I, I, you know, the only thing I could figure just looking at the the whole, you know, learning, picking up the cues better than Blackthorn has (laughs) is, you know, she's Christian. So I'm trying to figure out like how, if that plays into the protection as far as with the, if that, no. Yeah, no, I was what, just trying to put the Portuguese because, because to get the, called. I'm trying to answer your, I'm thinking out loud, I will freely admit. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we, don't, we don't have to, yeah. like, you know, yeah. if if nothing comes, man, I, I'm not even talking about her. I I understand based on everything we've, we've learned so far about the culture at the time yeah. of why she would want to die with them. That right. makes sense to me. I think she became Christian after that right. happened. Yeah. And um, which which but still that's her family and that's her that that's what those are the rules she first learned about the way the world works. Mm-hmm. So just because she takes up Christianity, it's not going to like circumvent it. I mean, yeah. she's still asked to die. Yeah. Um but where where I'm still trying to figure out motives and choices is with Bintaro and him, even though he's abusive and dismissive of Mariko, mm-hmm. they share the look yeah. um, 
uh, when when we think he's going to die mm-hmm. and a look of respect and and knowing that he orders her to live mm-hmm. by all else like it's it's interesting yeah um, so i do remember yeah so the yeah you, you, what you said earlier the, as far as the timeline, she had married him before the events happened. Okay, okay, it it, it had to have been because right. he he wouldn't that family wouldn't have like allowed that marriage to happen so, had right. this murder occurred. Exactly. So and and so and that's why on the anniversary of her death, whenever he you know she wants you know she wants to correct the injustice by you know joining the rest of the family. Right. Yeah, that makes that's that yeah. So that's why it makes sense because he he doesn't because she's his property and one and um but but he doesn't yeah. and he okay, go and, ahead. And, and it's, it's, it gets into the whole thing of the whole family honor and stuff. I mean, the honorable thing to do would be to die, but no, he's going to make her relive this dishonor every single year that when whenever they they have the, the anniversary of the tragedy. So that's that, that's his way of just like poking her each time like no you know you're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make you relive this dishonor every single year on the anniversary of it interesting yeah because and it goes into that control and that abusive relation you know not only the cultural dynamics that were going on but also just his you know clear abusive and dishonor and disrespect that he has towards her well (laughs) i don't know i don't know i i feel like I'm not saying that there's love there. It's an act of love or anything, mm. but I think it's a bit more complex because from what I can tell, he's all about honor and respect. Yeah. So why would he want to cont- and he, like her shame is also his shame. Well, but also because she has value to Tor- to Tornaga. Yeah, but As- that just recently happened. I mean, well, they, no, but she, she's been married been, for years. She's been married for years, but she was she's been trained to speak as an interpreter since she was a child. I mean, because remember the monk, the the uh, the the Portuguese uh, priest taught her. No, so, I understand that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, so she has some value beyond just you know to to Tornaga and why she continues to help Tornaga to show her usefulness to him, even though. Dishonor is still there. Yeah. I feel like if we continue talking about this, it'll just like continue going in circles. So I'm going to try to. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's. That, but, yeah. But we did finally learn, like, as you noted, it was that we did, you know, it's been hinted on. And so we finally did full, learn a full story about what happened there, uh, which also makes, you know, with speaking of honor and stuff uh, with Fiji and her family. And and learning of her father's dishonor too with the, with the swords with his coward's death, um, and and how she you know and especially when you know we see a similar parallel thing whenever her husband like stepped out of line and and committed up ritual suicide as well as you know taking their son, but then she you know now has to become the consort of the barbarian and but she continues to show her her her, her worth to to the community and you know, helping. Um, Blackthorn, you know, by being his consort and 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 help trying to help him learn the cultural ways and stuff, even though he still can't get him, still can't quite get it. <laughs> I don't, I don't feel like it's a value to the community. She's just becoming her own because yeah. she finds herself in this position tied to someone who doesn't want to pillow her, mm-hmm. who respects her, who gave her a gun. And who she now for has is just I feel like she 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 loves this new life that she's <laughs> walked into yeah. and she wants to protect it. Like there it's it's n- not only she knows what the community thinks of him and yeah. of her as being so but but we find in this episode that she's really owning her place and the place that just so happens like black throne has a lot of trust in her um and so i she's starting to become one of my favorite characters yeah yeah um, honestly yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because yeah, and, and she, to your point about she really likes this this, this station now because you know, whenever you know whenever uh, Bentaro was like you know calling kept calling her a consort to a barbarian, she's like she's I know I'm a consort to a Hadimoto. Yes, yeah, so, so she definitely is. She's like yeah, and, and that moment at the end of the episode too, I think uh, you know it, it's helping Blackthorn. Whenever she and Blackthorn shared that look, I mean, I think it was and, and her role as far as being in the consort to Hadamoto and doing all the things that she's been doing, even to the place of concealing the affair, <laughs> because she, you know she's no dummy. She 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 figured out what was going on whenever they had that conversation in the end of that last episode. Um, oh well, I don't know time wise, like yeah. how long, and also the way her and Mariko talk. Like I feel yeah. like Mariko would have came clean to her, entrusted her with that information. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciated that uh, that line from her. Like the Fuji who we met in the first episode would have never had the guts to say that to Ventoro. Right. But but now, since being around Mariko and um, Blackthorn, she does. So mm -hmm. so I I just it's it's really interesting to see. And at the same time, there was conflict between her and Blackthorn in this episode because of the pheasant, um, yep. where he, you know, he he picks up a few words and he just so happens to be able to tell them that they may not take this dead pheasant down. Um, it will rot, um, but in time it will be cooked and everything. And um, everyone's forbidden to touch it. Now, my first thought was Bentura was so going to take that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, but it wasn't um, the community, the village got together and was like, this pheasant has to go. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And and it and it was the gardener who we see throughout this episode who has become um, good friends with Blackthorn, and he ends up in his old age saying, "I'm willing to do it," and and he takes it down. Um, and then and then because of what Blackthorn says, Fuji ends up killing the gardener, and Blackthorn doesn't understand yeah. um, it at all. Um, and, and I feel like between this, this story arc, between the arc with Mariko and Bentoro, and even, even confronting, um, Taranaga at the end, and then having the earthquake, Blackthorn is really, every, all of the stability he thought what he had here in the last episode just continues to be like rotated and shaken mm -hmm. and and uh, like like his comfort um he he just finds himself no 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 don't get cozy you're still the outsider yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you've been around us for like a little bit of time that doesn't mean you are one of us like yeah. you you there you have so much more to learn like things are not yeah. Not this is still not where you're from. You you, you don't understand our rituals and um, the, our behavior. Yeah. So um, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. I mean, he's he's almost invited to the cookout, but not fully invited to the cookout. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but uh, yeah, that uh, the whole the whole dynamic there with um, with Blackthorn. Uh, would speak you know, again picking up a few things but still with the broken jap with his broken japanese like you know touch die and and i was as soon as that happened i was just like i was worried who was going to be the the sacri the person who would end up um you know losing their life over over that because i was like this is not going to end well um with the pheasant and it and it, and it was very tough you know, you too, like as you rightly said, I mean, it, it being the gardener, being the one um, that ends up losing his life over it, really does drive home the point that it, of what you just said about him getting don't get too comfortable, um, even though this. But also, I think it also is is helping Blackthorn come to realize that 
I this this place is slowly becoming my home too, and I've got to learn how to live in my new home. Um, and, and especially as we, what we saw, I think he he realizes that whenever we get to the end of the episode after he saves Tornaga, uh, with you know whenever they have the earthquake. Mm-hmm. But and uh, and then all you know and, and taking his you know the irony of taking the the you know Fuji's father's swords even though he was a coward but you know doing that act because understanding the value of those samurai swords and handing them over uh, to to Toranaga uh, and Toranaga recognizing that um, what what Blackthorn was doing there so I think that that really illustrates that point as far as like he, oh, he he's he's getting there he's getting there. Yeah, definitely. What yeah. did you think about Lord Toranaga in this episode? Oh, he, he, you, you know, like, he, as you said last week, he is so missed. And, so <laughs> <laughs> and and his presence does just elevate these episodes so, so, so much. I mean, from the very beginning, uh, when, um, it, you know, when he's drawing, you know, dressing down his son over over the actions that were that were that he had undertaken. And then, and also, uh, and also the interplay that he had with W. W. Uh, and again, knowing what you know, knowing uh, he's playing both sides, and Yabushige trying to like you know, you know, questions him about that it was his nephew who convinced his son to uh, to, to, to 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 take that action. And stuff, um, and and just sort of the whole dynamics that played out there. I just, it just again, just this shows that he's on one level, and everybody else is just like trying to just trying to just keep, trying to keep up with him. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so last week I I threw out there that I think that um, Ami is the spy, mm-hmm. and then you you mentioned no, there's a villager. Right. Who you think? It, it, so the villager at the end was that who you think it that, was? Yeah, because yeah, that was one. Yeah, so I was one for one. <laughs> I was wrong about yeah. Mataru, but I was right about the spy. <laughs> yeah, that's what I kept thinking about. Like at the end, when when it's or when it's confirmed yeah. that that villager, I'm like, wait a second, is that the person that Will was mentioning? Oh, now we're we're even <laughs> on <Yeah>. the <laughs> on the prediction. Granted, I still there's there's just something about um where I don't think it's one spy. I really mm-hmm. don't. Um but for all I know it was it's just a it's just a through line to kind of drive in this whole dynamic of Omni who wants to take over his uncle's position, his uncle playing at both sides of this um war between Taranaga and Ishido and then Toranaga also knowing that he he has this ally who can't be trusted but can still be manipulated and that's the only reason why he's still alive mm-hmm. like that's why I find his character to be so interesting it's just because he he's Everyone knows who he is. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a trustworthy person, which makes him honestly a trustworthy person when you're playing a political game. <laughs> because you're exactly. like, at least it's very clear to me that I can't trust you, but I also know what you want. So in a way I can, because it's the people who I don't know mm-hmm. what they want, I can't trust. Or who want, who I know want the same thing that I do, which... Um, that's that's Lord Ishibo. So yeah. it's just yeah. it's I loved it. like and I still I'm I'm like it, it might take me to the very end of the season to just just continue to say, please go back and watch the first episode. This mm-hmm. character was not dumb in that first episode. So what the fuck happened? Because I I as much as I love him, I feel like we're getting a different character. And that inconsistency is kind of driving me a bit crazy just because we're really supposed to see his his nephew as being this bright person. 
who because he he managed to even like surprise Toranaga and be like, oh well, he played my son, so now I'm going to give him the cannon regimen, and and reward him because that's someone who I want as an ally who's like a trickster. But the nephew did not understand what was going on in the first episode. Okay, I'm just I just yeah. can't get over that. Again, yeah. it'll probably take me into the till the very no, last. You're, episode. You're, you're, <laughs> You're right on. You're right on point. I mean, because because again, Toranaga was like when because when Yabushige was like, I'll you know we'll I'll discipline him for like, you know, corrupt you know manipulating your son. Toranaga's like, no, don't. Right. He is like he has given me cover. Yeah. So yeah. So when Ashida like wants to start war and he thinks you know because you know, he's thinking tactically because like if we go to osaka which i know i know we, we got i do want us to talk about that and what's going on there they'll 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 take us out but mm-hmm. we're going to make him come to us because and, and you know we got the tactical advantage now with these cannons and other things so i thought that was again you know he everybody else is just you know dawdling around you know trying to get their little 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 feet them and he's just like i'm looking at i'm I'm gonna get the whole empire oh but he's been that way lord tarnaga has been that way since day one like and and he's also they they continue to back up what other characters have said about him being trickster Mm -hmm. and he continues to do that he he has a whole speech about ravens and uh, yeah. and, and hawks and everything and and prey and predators and it's just it's really interesting. Um, it is. And I, 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 he he's definitely needed just because everybody else is still figuring out what they're doing. <laughs> 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 they they have their eye on a prize, but they don't really understand what you have to do to get there. Yeah. Um, while Taranaga has not only already secured that, but moved on to a different game, um, yeah. which brings us to Osaka, which simultaneously we're getting some, we're getting some, crossover to say okay while this is going on over here with Toranaga Ishido is having to deal with the the council um that yep. is in a bit of a political <laughs> disarray <laughs> <laughs> and it's just they're very calmly arguing <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um which which is exactly what Toranaga predicts was going to happen was like, okay, I'll just remove myself. But Ishido, just because I'm no longer there, don't think that your quote unquote allies are suddenly going to let you pick a replacement um, uh, or do things like so willingly. Um, But yeah. So, so what did you think about the, the council in this episode, Will? Oh, I, uh, I, that, the whole, the whole dynamic going on there where they're, you know, sitting there going back and forth, you know, Ashido is, is not high born. So whenever, you know, the Kai, Kayama was like, that sea will stink of countryside. And then, yeah, and I was like, Ooh, and then, um, you know, what, Ishido retorts with that uh, seems stink of Christian. I mean, it was just like the infighting there. It was just, I just, that was, I, I was just chewing that scene up because it was, I, I just love seeing as predicted and why, to, you know, Toronaga again was so smart to resign. They were just going to devour themselves and, and, and resort to infighting. And then, you know, Lady, Osh- Lady Oshibo is this, you know, returns and, yeah. you know, with the plan to, you know, she was the X factor there because you know her son is 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 just waiting to turn sixteen so he could take over, and and she's just like, you know, she's playing her cards now, as far as like, well, okay, with this, with this whole situation. So so I guess my question, I, I appreciate where they ended this episode with her basically telling Ishido bend the knee. Mm-hmm. Um, which Game of Thrones callback. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but but I don't. I'm I, I'm I'm trying to understand a why she thinks she has a lot of power. I I get it. She's the mother of the heir. I understand that. But but this is 
and and I'm gonna say this as a woman, this is a men a, a men's game. So so Ishido. I guess, <laughs> I guess also where where I where I um where I'm confused is Ishido wanted her back at the palace in Osaka. Right. right. So what what was his game plan for her return? See, I don't think he saw her as a threat. But, but and then my question is why? Because he he seems a bit more tactical. He seems like a f- fair um, opponent for Toranaga. Maybe Toranaga has some edge, mm. but there there's something about where he was playing pulling the strings in the first episode where I'm like he had to have some kind of reasoning for wanting her to return, and also more importantly, Lord Toranaga not wanting her to return. Yeah, and and at this point, I don't know. To be honest, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I think I, I mean that's that's <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I think that's 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 intentional. I think they are trying to like, and rightly so. What are the motivations here? Because you know it clear it was clear when the Taiko died, the previous Taiko died. He you know he drew up this will to because he saw where these other regents were going to go. Mm-hmm. And and so I don't know if there's you know the lawyer in me was sort of like okay there's got to be it must be some clause back there that he had tucked away in his will <laughs> that that, that uh, Lady Oshida is like using to to now she's playing that hand I mean I, I mean granted everybody would probably would be aware of that if if that you know if whenever the Regents saw the will where they set up the council um, but um, I, yeah I. I it's a very interesting game, but she, you know that now that she, she, I guess he, I guess Ashida was like the calculus I have right now is just I, I know what I've got to deal with the Christians, I know what I got to deal with Tornaga, but now she's this new X factor that I wasn't anticipating. So I guess we'll see how that all plays out in the subsequent episodes. Yeah. We will. I I don't agree that he wasn't anticipating her because he wanted her back in the castle. Well, but I think he, I, yeah. Yeah, I just I I'm the way they left the episode with their conversation um, leaves me wanting to see the next episode and just how that dynamic continues to play out um, in surprising ways, because now we have for us as a viewer, we're introduced to a brand new player. Yeah. Knowing that this ah. player is familiar with the players that we have gotten to know over the last few episodes. Yeah. So, one thought I, yeah. And one thought I did have while we were just while we were talking about it, you know, the, given that you reminded me that he wanted her at the castle, mm-hmm. Tornaga wanted her away. Yeah. Part of it is that he wanted her and the son to be there so they could just have a convenient, de- you know, they just con- the convenient assassin take him out. <laughs> Right, right. Which again is just why I'm like, Ish- Ishido, are you gonna let her talk like that way? Are you supposed to like kill her? <laughs> like, yeah, what? Yeah. What's going on here? Yeah. Um, so, so I, I don't know. I just, I, 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 I'm curious about this, especially when I think about how um, it, one, some of his playing, um, his. Um, one of his cards might have been what was somewhat speculated upon that the heir isn't really the heir and is actually Toranaga's son. Mm-hmm. So, mm. oh, oh, yeah, you know, we've been yeah, wondering about that. Know? Yeah, so See, it goes I, back. I cannot pronounce their names. I apologize. I can, but I also just like I get I get scared. But I remember things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you no, that's a good callback with the with their conversation when when the Taiko and Tornago were talking about Ashido. That's a yeah. good callback. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I think that it is it for us tonight. Will, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you? Yes, you can find me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Will M Polk, W I L L M P O L K. And you can find me there, too, at SJ Belmont, S-J-B-E-L-M-O-N-T. Please follow our crew there. 
at scene and nerd friend us on facebook follow us on instagram and threads at scene underscore n underscore nerd and visit our website www.sceneandnerdpodcast.com but most importantly rate follow and comment on apple Podcasts, spotify youtube or wherever your podcast good night geek out you're welcome